think of matter itself as a phase of consciousness, not necessarily in time, but the same way that like water has different phases from ice and vapor to actual liquid. And so matter itself is sort of just a different phase. It hasn't quite, it's in mo like everything is. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Fundamentalists. Did you like that? I did. I did like that. That was, that was fun, great. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes us look like we're having intelligent conversations <laughs> before we kick off. Yeah, yeah which yeah. We, we were. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, my name is Elliot, and this is Pete, and this is The Fundamentalist. Guys, it's good to see you. It's good to be back without um, a guest. I know it's been so long where you've seen and heard just me and Pete talk, but if you missed it, um, the last episode, or maybe the next episode. Yeah, it might be the next episode. Yeah, because this, this is a topical one a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Uh, we, had, we had slash have Jay Baker, um, and that was a very fun podcast that I enjoyed doing very much. Yeah, great. We should have guests more often, Pete. I know. I didn't do very much. I just sat and let you guys talk. So we had two mics. There was three of us, and we, me and Jay had to pass the mic. So, and every now and again, you try to bring me into the conversation, mm -hmm. but I kind of fell flat because I was just no. enjoying listening to you yeah. two talk. You blame that on the mics. That's funny. Yep. <laughs> um, ha, ha, ha. Uh, hi, guys. This is a podcast where we discuss all sorts of things. Uh, what is a podcast? I like that this is your, like, it's like you're explaining what a yeah. podcast is. If you're watching, you're probably aware. Yeah. Um, but we talk about all sorts of fun stuff from philosophy to psychology to cultural issues. This particular episode is about a slightly more topical topic, uh, more relevant, more current. And before we dive into it, if you would like to support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash the fundamentalists. It is a desert wasteland right now but for our patrons <laughs> who are going where you guys I are. Know. Uh, we have a very good habit of hitting the ground running and then stopping immediately and hitting the ground running. So if you want Patreon whiplash, go to patreon.com slash the fundamentalists for 15% off uh, car insurance. Um, so this particular episode, Pete, yep. I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are talking about anti-work. Yes. All right. Now, specifically, um, the launching point for this conversation is the very popular subreddit from reddit.com r slash anti-work. Now, as of this month, which is still January, anti-work was the fastest growing non-official subreddit on the website wow. over a million members absolutely blowing up and the purpose of anti-work r slash anti-work is to <clears throat> bring attention to work reform to bring attention to the ways employees are mistreated by the system and to bring attention to the ways in which the system itself uh, as a whole uh, is more so than ever before, doing an actual disservice to the idea of being able to live a happy, productive life in a normal nine to five. Mm -hmm. Does that make, does that? That sounds good. I mean, you're given a very rosy picture of it. Very rosy picture. Because I'm sure, but with any subreddit that big, I'm sure there's lots of there it is. Here you go. Uh, messiness in it as well. So this, you know, that's my favorite part. Uh, now here's the thing. That's the beautiful <laughs> idyllic version of this subreddit. However, uh, recently, that's like they're, they're, if it was on a dating app, that's yes. the, it, that would be its profile. Yes. Yep. Which they probably wouldn't have the energy to get on a dating app anyway. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, it, ideally it's a, you know, this sort of very strong political state. It, it's called at its best a movement. All right. And, uh, the other side of that is that, uh, a few days ago, there was an interview from Fox news with Jesse waters and one of the moderators of r slash anti work moderators on Reddit do not get paid anything. This is one of the oldest moderators of, uh, this particular form. This may not seem like a big deal. It may not seem like a subreddit on some website is anything uh, to get all hot and bothered over. However, I think if you just consider a year ago with everything that happened with GameStop, uh, Wall Street Bet, Super Stonk, all this stuff, there was an actual, you know, market kind of effect from these kinds of things. How's it's, your AM AMC stock doing? Well, you know, a buddy of mine got me into crypto, Pete. You want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, huh. I don't know. Probably I'm missing AMC a little bit, but um, that was a very fun movement. Uh, kind of a similar idea of sticking it to... Uh, to these people that are just, you know, just reaping in profits off of the backs of workers and blah, blah, blah. Um, they chose a moderator who, let's just say, is probably the archetypal image you have of a Reddit 
moderator. Uh, someone who was incredibly disheveled, um, uh, difficult for them to make eye contact with the camera or the interviewer, Jesse Waters, I believe that's his name. And it created a, a, a storm on Reddit, an absolute <clears throat> crapshoot of people um, <clears throat> banning this person. This person got defensive, banned a bunch of other people. Uh, who were saying they asked people prior to this interview if they should go on Fox News to represent their cause. And everyone said, no, that's a bad idea. Fox News is not your friend and they're not going to make you look good. And sure enough, they chose this particular moderator. There are those who believe that this person was paid. There are those that they're a shill uh, because they were so bad at mm -hmm. presenting the message um, of the anti-work, the, the idyllic message that I, I yeah. said a, a second ago. Uh, and also there are those who believe that Fox News per, per, uh chose this person specifically because they have that look. They sort of have the image of what you would imagine uh, or what, you know, someone in a different country of a different conservative political ideology might imagine like an anti-work person to be, of sort mm -hmm. of lazy, um, you know, antisocial, um, gross, gross person. Um, and so there's all this drama around this person. And now there's all this talk of the movement is dead. It's done. You know, it was going so well. One interview, it's two minutes long. I watch it. I actually don't think it's that bad. Uh, it's pretty bad, but it's not that bad. So this brings up all sorts of fun things to talk about. We yes. could talk about the, uh, strictly visual part. If you've seen any of this interview you have on the left side, Jesse Waters, he's sort of a grown frat boy. He, uh, well put together, handsome guy. Uh, you have Doreen, the moderator on the other side. Uh, she is blurry. She is, looks, you know, not totally hygienic and, um, kind of slurred, not very well articulate, I would say, not very articulate. Uh, always a fun word to mess up. Um, yeah. <laughs> very ironic. So there's that part where you have almost a yin-yang image that's getting broadcast to people that obviously will have an effect on the overall movement. And then you have this idea of anti-work and you have mm -hmm. people who go, uh, go at it from different angles. <clears throat> Some people go, I don't want to work because I don't want to work and I'm lazy and there's nothing wrong with being lazy. That's something to talk about. You also have people who go, no, there is legitimate reasons why we have to start adjusting to the idea of anti-work as automation becomes more popular as we recognize that there uh, is a wealth gap that's only getting bigger, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, um, all that stuff. So yes. we, you have all sorts of opinions here, Pete. Why don't uh -oh. you chime in and, and, and stumble over some words? Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, so you showed me a little bit of that interview just before we kicked off, but I'm kind of new to this, didn't know about this movement. I did know, of course, that more and more people are opting not to work. And I was sharing with you this morning, that's what I... Did. So I suppose in my teens and 20s, um, and actually all my life, <clears throat> I have been anti-work <laughs> yeah. um, uh, as a kind of a position, more of a just, so I lived um, over eight years, about eight years of my, from 17 or 18 years old, I was on unemployment benefit on and off for about eight years. And this is in Ireland? This is in Ireland, yeah. Um, and then lived in a place called The Village, uh, which is a loyalist estate in Northern Ireland. I don't um, know what that means. Uh, that a hell hole. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> is that really what it means? <clears throat> well, a uh, loyalist estate is a is is a kind of a paramilitary estate, a working class estate. Who were they? Who were they loyal to? Uh, the queen, queen and country. So there were the Republicans, and they they were uh, fighting for United Ireland, the Republic, and then there were the Loyalists, and they were fighting for uh, to keep Northern Ireland part of the United Kingdom. I see. Yeah. And you were on that side. Uh, I was in, well, I was in, you were that, living. I was in, I was living in that environment. Yeah. yeah. For a time. And I lived in a squat for a while. It, it was, it started off as a paid accommodation and then became so dilapidated. It became a squat. Cool. And some of the best years of my life. Loved yeah. it. But I, um, very early on kind of didn't, I think thought that work was mostly alienating. It was mostly having to do something to make money for someone else, do creating something that you have no investment in. I just didn't like it. And so, yeah, opted not to do it. Isn't that interesting? There is such a, even as you say that, there's a little um, thing that goes off <clears throat> in my brain yeah. that's like, uh, I guess, moralizing that mentality of being like, there. there's a, it's like you imagine the American dream. Like mm. you go to work and you work your way up. 
and yeah. you you pay your dues and then you're rewarded mm. uh and but the reality especially now is that does that seems less and less possible mm. um and but yet there's still this this uh very american thing of working is more moral yeah. like not working is amoral <clears throat> and you yeah. taking taking money from the government mm -hmm. amoral yeah that's bad yeah yeah no that's interesting and in ireland it's it's a, it's a slightly different culture so work doesn't have that dimension obviously a lot of people work but it doesn't have that same cultural yeah. thing i think that it does in america yeah my understanding is it's the um protestant there's some sort of, uh, it's a Protestant work descendant ethic. of Protestant, yeah, the work ethic of the Protestants yeah. from, from when we founded the country and, uh, yeah. and working became a, um, you know, it's what God wanted you to do. Uh, yeah. We well, see I, uh, Max Weber's famous book on that. But the, the, the interesting, interesting thing is, so I wouldn't call myself anti-work at all because I'm very pro-work. And that's, that's why I think, I don't know much about this movement or anything about it, but the term is, um, uh, I would say, unfortunate. Because I think work, it, the, the truth of the American dream is that work brings value, sacrifice. When we sacrifice, when we work hard, there is a certain satisfaction and enjoyment yeah. in that sacrifice. The issue only for me is that when we sacrifice and work hard for things that we have no investment in. So, you know, like whether it's flipping burgers or whatever it is that you're spending, you know, eight hours of your day working and sacrificing, um, but you're not, you're not kind of like uh you're not creatively invested in what you're doing yeah. even if you're getting well paid even if you're like an accountant and you're getting very well paid for your accountancy you're still spending the majority of your life doing something that you potentially have minimal yeah kind of sp it's spiritual in, in one sense of that term kind of investment in do you um <clears throat> do you think that that is uh maybe like do you buy into the existential kind of like you can it doesn't matter what you're doing if you you can find joy in it and you can you can uh flip that burger and you can make it the best burger uh ever and you can you can find satisfaction in even the mundane uh of jobs like that i think that's a lovely idea i don't know mm -hmm. that it's sustainable yeah i mean there's a certain level of truth to it like you can find very satisfying work in difficult work but it's it's very it's very hard to find meaning if you're doing something that's you're sacrificing all of your time and effort for a minimal wage um to to kind of prop up someone else it's very that's 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 very difficult to find yeah. so what i think you can find meaning in you know around it and and this is the issue for me is that I, so for example, I, you can never advise somebody, I was on The Minimalist recently and we, we did a live show in LA and some people were, uh, minimalists are friends of ours, have a podcast about how to minimize your life and um, they, they had corporate jobs, they left those corporate yeah. jobs, they got rid of stuff and yeah, I'd love to talk about that in a second but um, you know, some people were asking advice and of course it's very hard to give general advice but I would say this is that sometimes people we think that, for example, when, like I like holidays. Uh, in order to have holidays, I have to have money. In order to have money, I need a job. Mm -hmm. right? But the truth is, you probably only need the holiday because you do a job that you don't like. So, for example, I don't do holidays because I enjoy what I do. Right? But it's like a holiday is almost what you need to kind of imagine, oh, I'm going to go away for two weeks. I'm going to be, get away from all of this work. So the very thing that you're saving up you have to have the job to save the money to have the holiday. If you were kind of had your own time and space, you probably wouldn't feel the need for a holiday. Another thing is people work in order to get for you know health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. But a, a huge amount of illness is generated by working in alienated environments. Mm. I mean, even getting up every day to an alarm over time will, will stress your life, having a boss, all of that. So a lot of... A lot of people's health issues are connected precisely to spending eight or 10 hours of their life, you know, commuting, working in jobs they don't like, being stressed, and would find themselves healthier. Or another thing is food. I mean, people work hard, so they have to do DoorDash and they do Postmates and they maybe eat unhealthily. It affects their health. If you had more time, you could buy cheap things and cook from scratch and eat healthier food. 
at a fraction of the cost. Yeah. So the, the funny thing about jobs is, and also the best things in life are free, right? So I genuinely, when I was living like that in the squat, my favorite thing to do is to think, right? I love thinking and I love reading. So I'll read a little bit and then I'll think. It's just free. It's it. mm-hmm. That's so good. And then what I would do is I would go to university every day when I wasn't there studying and I would just walk into classes and sit in philosophy classes mm-hmm. and listen. So I did that for a year. And I, I was just thinking about it this morning when you said about this, I'm like, that's a weird thing to do. I can't believe I had the balls to do it. In retrospect, I didn't, I just went into the university. I would ask the lecturers, like, can I sit in the back and listen? Um, cause I was wanting to do a master's and all of that. So I, that was free. I was able to sit. Now you can watch YouTube videos. You don't even have to go to the local university and it doesn't mean you can ha- not have a job, but, but it's sometimes it might be easier to, um, uh, to find a way to live cheaply. I say I live with eight people in this kind of, yeah, which brings family. up the minimalist, um, yeah. kind of idea. Yeah. It's mm. like, you just, you reduce your means and you realize that it's very, uh, I wouldn't say easy. I'm sure it's very difficult. I've never really done it, but when you're when you're established in that minimalist lifestyle, I'm sure it's very like, oh yeah, like you don't need all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, what and it's <clears throat> like, <coughs> excuse me. I um, I was thinking uh, last night I was watching this show my brother and uh, sister in law recommended called Search Party on HBO, and it's been around for like five seasons, and I hadn't watched it. And, uh, started watching it and it was really I enjoyed it a lot but one of the um, characters who reminds me of myself a little bit uh, was upset with this girl coming in and touching all of his stuff and he was like it's my st- like don't touch I like my stuff don't touch my stuff like mm-hmm. I like my stuff and I heard that and I was like what stuff what stuff do I like I was like mm-hmm. I don't I have a few things that I like yeah like stuff wise yeah I, d- I really don't have, like, it could go in a, a van easily. Yeah. Eh. I know. It's like, and people have so much stuff. Yeah. So well, why do you have it? I did. I, I moved once and I re- and the, the movers, I had the stuff in storage for three months and then it was brought to the new apartment and they didn't bring about three boxes of stuff. Just didn't bring them. And I didn't notice for over a year. Didn't, didn't bring about like so they brought like my the boxes of my stuff but they somehow missed about three boxes of oh, my really? possessions yeah, no. and completely didn't notice it was only when i was looking for certain books and i was like this is weird i know i've got these books yeah and i was like oh yeah and it was like it was so long past that i obviously didn't even contact them but yeah. like I just don't notice it yeah um, it's crazy um and that's yeah. one way of of adjusting it just it sucks man it's it, i wish it was um it's such an unfortunate, I, I want to go back to what you're saying about the branding of it, the, the way that the anti-work uh, were, it's like anti-exploitation, I guess might be a better, more accurate word, but that's not very catchy. So yeah. what do you do? And it's like everyone gets exploited and it's like, that's you, the dues you pay and you have to do it. It's how it works. That's life. Move on. And yet it just keeps getting worse and worse. So it seems um, like I was, there's so much, uh, 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 criticism happening right now of of biden and how he i think he like walked away from a reporter asking about forgiving student debt um and i was i i I see both sides of the story because i'm like well you took the loans out i'm taking loans out to go to school i have no uh fantasy that that's gonna go away i'll just assume that i'll pay it throughout my life and that's okay and it's worth it um definitely worth it but these folks are like no this is you need to forgive this debt I'm like, why? And then when I read about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that kind of does make sense. Like, this is, um, these are predatory loans. These are, like, taking advantage of kids at a young age and then, you know, saddling with them with this debt uh, saddling for mm. their entire lifetime. Uh, and also, supposedly, if you were to forgive it, the government would make more money. The government would have, um, because people's livelihoods wouldn't be sucked into these just paying off interest constantly. Yeah. Um, but, and it's also such a weird, it's like, 
it used to be, well, you could pay your way through college. You know, you have a job and then you, you go through college and you wait tables at night and you earn your degree and then you're good to go. And that was great for, you know, 30 years ago, but mm. it's like, I don't think that can happen anymore. The college prices are astronomically high. Yeah. There's no, like, there's nothing keeping them down. The cost of living continues to go up no matter whether or not the wages go up. Uh, and no wonder people are just kind of pissed off at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you could say like in some respects, one of the central uh, cures of psychoanalysis, I would say, is to loosen the effect of the symbolic law, which means that, for especially for neurotics, is that you don't have to do this. You like what people <laughs> feel is that they have to, you know, get a job. They have to go to college. Then you get a job and you get married and you have kids. You know, and and we feel this is called the big other. We feel this this entire. Um, no one's telling us to do it, and yet it feels like it's coming from everywhere. Yeah, so, the story is there. You just have yeah. to walk through and hit all the steps. You hit all the steps. It, it's everywhere. All the plot nowhere. points. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all there. And the truth is you don't have to do it. You don't have to go to college. You don't have to get married. You don't have to know. You're like, you could do, you don't have to get the dog, but you also can. You can get married. You can get the job. But it's almost like there's a certain sense in which we get onto these this trail and the yeah. trail involves making getting lots of debt potentially in college and then working in a job that potentially we don't get any personal investment from yeah and for me the big thing and not maybe not the anti-work although it sounds like there's a core but for me that the message is that you don't have to go that direction there are all, there are alternatives yeah. so for me and the reason why i don't like anti-work is when I was unemployed, I wrote my first book. So wrote my first book, went to university every day, uh, set up a community. Um, so I was working, but I was working just doing stuff yep. that 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 I loved. So and I was sacrificing, but the, I was enjoying the sacrifice. I wasn't sacrificing for something I didn't enjoy. Yeah, that's a good word I think to to highlight is uh, sacrifice. People I think assume that if you're quote unquote anti work, which I agree, it's not a good term. Uh, that you're opting for life without sacrifice. And I think yeah. that is a great way to end up unhappy is to yeah. have a life in which you're not. Um, it's this vision yeah, of luxury exactly. communism that's floating around that some people are into is, uh, you know, fully automated luxury communism, they call it. Yeah. I mean, and it was ironically named like that by uh, Mark Fisher. Or whatever. But, um, but this notion of like almost a, a world in which things will be so mechanized that we won't have to work. I mean, that yeah. vision's been around for a long time. Um, used to be in heaven, and now it's kind of yeah. like in the you know Utopia. twenty years time, whatever. Yeah. So, but of course, the 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 idea is no. This fully automated luxury communism would be disastrous. A world without sacrifice and work is a world without meaning because mm -hmm. meaning and sacrifice are interconnected. The problem we have is that people sacrifice for others, and it, it creates a weird thing. So if I sacrifice. For example, to make Jeff Bezos even richer, um, I'm I'm really suffering badly. I'm losing twice. People are dying in in Amazon factories. People are being mistreated. So the losers lose doubly, but even the winners lose because whenever you don't have sacrifice, you just get excess. You you experience a type of melancholic yeah. lack of desire. So you have to make bigger and bigger kind of more stupid purchases and plans in order to try to kind of render some meaning into the world. Yeah, your space. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we never released our space episode, but because I was very, I'm a, I was a defender and I'm a defender, interestingly, of Musk's space, not not Bezos' space vision, but Musk's. We have to put that one out sometime. Sure, yeah. That. Or not. You'll just have to. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's our business meeting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I uh, what was I going to say the the what do you say when you what's the sacrifice you're getting paid? How's the sacrifice? Yeah, well you see, you you do the sacrifice and I suppose the reward is the payment. Yeah. Yep. So what's the problem? Well, I just asked oh, so that you can yes. explain it. I know. What the <laughs> well, do you want me to be surplus? I don't want to sound <laughs> <Yes>. too Marxist. <laughs> I'm trying to go full Marxist. Yeah, yeah. So I I don't like the marxism that's around at the moment but in old school marxism yes uh is that you never get paid uh the value you create and i think there's something really interesting in that idea so labor is you know uh, yeah labor theory of value is fascinating all of the is critiques it? 
Because I just fell asleep when you said that. (laughs) Okay, yeah, no, we won't get into that labor theory of Um, value. (laughs) I was, uh, speaking of the, you know, um, I apologize, it's the morning, so it takes me a second to (coughs) form my thoughts. But um, when you're talking about, you know, you don't have to do it this way. We don't have to, to, there's two points uh, to make. One is that reminded me of um, my wedding planning uh, with Grace where we were, the ball was rolling and we were just like, okay. I mean, this mm. would have been at this point, eight months from now, we would have been doing this way. We're mm. talking about it, showing you the location. Beautiful. Like very fun. One day we were just like, I, we don't have to do this. Like there's no reason at mm. all. And we don't seem excited about it. And yet there's something in it where both of us are doing it, either thinking the other person wanted it. And so therefore it was good or that other people wanted it or that, you know, it was always, mm. It wasn't coming from us, and, to, and not saying that the wedding itself is well. The, that wedding was canceled. The marriage is still going to happen, but we were like, we can do this in our own way. That isn't going to make us like feel like we're performing for other people, basically. Yeah. And I think that's related a little bit to um, how people go through their lives, where it's like, you got to do this, and whoever sees me on the outside will know that I'm doing the right thing. And I think we can all um, fall into that. One of the which brings me to the second point. The other thing that I really have found that I love is these things called con men. Oh, yeah. I watched this documentary uh, recently about a guy who is still out there. His name is Freeguard. Last name's Freeguard. David Freeguard, I think. And he uh, <laughs> he was an insane con man, like yeah. really, really good at being. He told people he was um, worked for MI5 or whatever. Is that what it's called? MI5? MI5 is one of them. In the yeah, and, and yeah. he, yeah. Um, I think it was in Ireland or something like that, or somewhere where it was during the time of the, maybe the Troubles. Troubles. Yeah, yeah, and he, he started lying to people and taking them around, taking these women specifically, and guys sometimes, and ba- essentially kidnapping them, lock them in, and you'd be like, we, the whole time, saying that, that the government, he they just goes place to place mm-hmm. wherever the you know he gets phone calls. He doesn't ask questions. And if you want to be an agent like me, you can come in on this mission. People did it. He wiped out people's savings constantly. Really horrible stuff. But there's one story I gotta tell you about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This dude. This is the most. This is the most insane, psychotic, uh, in my opinion, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> This one woman had, uh, she was divorced. She had two kids. Okay. First, this kid who's in probably 14. Okay. He's a little effeminate. He tells everybody, this con man tells everyone that the kid is gay and he's afraid to tell everybody just for no, just for no reason. Okay. And the kid's not gay. He's yeah. just, he's like, no, I'm not. So this kid straight up is like, <laughs> which alone the thought process of making up something like that and then right. spreading a rumor and forcing a 14 year old kid to do this because he wanted to separate the kids from the, the mom essentially so he's yeah. doing all this stuff that's kind of like psychological torture basically to these kids but the best part was at one point this kid uh he he gets he pisses off the con man or whatever and he uh he sends him to school and before he sends him to school, he grabs one of his shoes and he goes, I'm putting this on your heel because of what you did. You have to you have to wear this around as a little piece of metal, yeah. like a tap shoe thing on one of his shoes so that when he walked down the halls at school, everybody mm-hmm. would hear this tap and he would be humiliated the entire time. I was like, Whoa, I was like just the sheer creativity of that uh, horrendous thing to do to a teenager. I was like, this guy this guy's got no rules. This yeah. guy sees that you, there's <laughs> absolutely no rules and he is, it is his world and we're all just living in it. And, uh, and he's still out there. He's still got some woman yeah. that is convinced that, uh, he's, he's a good guy. So, yeah. So yeah, he's completely outside the symbolic order. Yeah. So he's obviously mm-hmm. psychotic. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, that's the other. So for neurotics, they're too intertwined in the social order. And then for a psychotic structure, so there you're not entwined at all. You're like, just, you, yep. You can't even sometimes re- even read the rules. You don't even you don't feel them. You're yeah. not you're not in what's they're not in the big other. You're not in the uh, the grammar of the social structure. Wild. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know. not anything I am uh, condoning or or putting a, a good you know thumbs up moral stamp on it. Man, <laughs> I would watch that guy. I mean, the stuff that he did was just uh, just. 
just incredible. Well, you see, <laughs> you know, you see people like this, and they're not they're not doing it for evil. Um, but like on YouTube, these guys who can um like act the most crazy type of way, like so they can go out and uh to even your man what's his uh, steve zaragoza steve zaragoza <laughs> as he does that he can probably do that stuff pizza 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 yeah uh Sh- sasha Bo- baron Cohen. baron Cohen. he's very good at this. but there's certain people who can yep they literally feel no shame like they can go out create incredibly embarrassing situations oh yeah um and and it's partly because for either they can you know switch off that for comic effect or they're very good at it because they're literally going like well i don't feel the social mores i don't no, feel yeah. yeah i can i can learn them but i don't feel them yeah steve can do that with um prank calls like uh, which i can't I, my the mm. shame the embarrassment washes yeah. over me i can feel it physically yeah. he can turn all that off sasha baron cohen i think is um yeah it's the same idea yeah. of being able to just like, uh, it's a person like if you could get in the lift and you're completely happy to turn towards the wall if you know if, if you walk into a lift and there's a few people where everyone faces the door if you're a person who has no compunction, you could literally just turn and face everybody. Yeah. Then you're not feeling the social norm. Nope. <laughs> yeah. But but you still look at the door because you know what the social norm is. But if you don't feel a neurotic person would never be able to do that. Like, yeah. It feel too awkward. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So yeah. you don't have to to pay attention to what the overarching narrative is that we all are born with. Do you feel though the the sort of protestant moral um work ethic like uh any hint of it does it feel like something you were just sort of naturally didn't recognize not unlike a sasha baron cohen where you just don't register that kind of maybe as a result of being from ireland yeah definitely didn't really register or didn't kind of feel compelled by a lot of the the steps that other people did yeah Yeah. no i i you know so for me for example it was just it was never a moral decision not to work in a in a regular job. It's just I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> and it was never. I never went to university to become a lecturer or anything like. Mm-hmm. Like I just um, did what I kind of. Do you ever look back and go, man? I wish I just had a. It would have been so much uh, easier or uh, simpler if I had uh, just got gotten into the system. Well, no, because like you can't nap. Like, how do you nap during the day? Yeah, if you've got a job. No, you know, uh, that's uh, that's uh, like that's just that's yeah. the kind of shit that really confuses me. But you don't you really don't have any kind of you don't think about you don't go look at all those people in those office buildings. <laughs> <laughs> that does not seem appealing. You no, know, yeah. I've been very lucky as well. So but it, but a funny thing is, you know, regardless of whether, you know, I had a published book, like I wrote a book that I never published. That was my first book that never, you know, I just wrote it to write a book and it wasn't good enough to be published really but um what was it called uh that was called beyond god mm. it's a very simple title um and but and so i was happy just doing that but then i kind of i say i was lucky i got published and then i got to come to america and i get to make a living now and in the second half of my life be very comfortable doing that yeah so i was very lucky but to be honest no happier like you know yeah. in fact the unhappiest point in my life was whenever i had the most money when i first came to america and uh yeah yeah that was the unhappiest moment when you yeah came yeah it was because i'd kind of you know out of my the environment that i lived in um i was kind of like navigating a whole new world and yeah 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 i um i uh i enjoy i gotta delete reddit but i, I i've enjoyed the rise of the anti-work um subreddit not i didn't realize that it was um becoming kind of this at least according to them a a substantial movement but i i would enjoy the posts made about employers and the way that they were being treated by the employees and it would very often be stuff like someone requested vacation days off and the ways in which the employer or the manager would call and go, we know you request this off, but we need all hands on deck and we need everybody given 110% and there's no raises this year because, you know, you try really hard and we're a team and that, it becomes, you start seeing, I think, how saccharine and just kind of BS a lot of that that stuff is because it's always the same and it's always guilting the worker 
to go above and beyond because that's what come on we really need you. it's like playing it an emotional kind of like uh oh just do this just come on you know and i know you did this and we're not going to honor your days off but you know here's a five dollar gift card and yeah. it's like that is um yeah i think people are getting a little bit especially when it's being posted online and, and getting going into people's consciousness a little bit more it's not it doesn't seem like uh people are going to stand for that much yeah much longer yeah. no th i mean this is the key thing for me like i've always been this like the key thing for me is oh there's been a massive hole in my sock sorry for anybody looking as <laughs> you talk about not working <laughs> yeah yeah um is that that it's all a, you know at its core it's about how do we have non-alienating work how do we engage in society in a way in which we're working in a in a way that engages us that's fulfilling that's enjoyable how do we bring democracy into the workplace democracy you know, the, almost the evolution of society is the kind of the, the expansion of democracy. So democracy in the workplace might mean, you know, the workers get to have a vote in things yep. like, do they take a raise? Do they put that money back into the business? Do they, uh, you know, wh what should people get paid? So it's not that everyone gets paid the same or anything like that, but it's that, that people get to vote and people yeah. get, get to feel connected now this is all very idealistic and it's, it's almost impossible to imagine what it looks like i don't get it yeah yeah but we but as a you know she's like i think it was fisher actually said and she's ex echoed it that you know we can imagine the end of the world and we you know in movies hollywood movies imagine the end of the world they imagine aliens coming they imagine all sorts of incredible things but it's hard for us to imagine what it might look like uh for people to have fulfilling work and that's weird because we don't have a failure of imagination about seeing the destruction of the world or what, you know, but, but we seem to have a failure of imagination going like, what would it mean for people to enjoy the sacrifice that they give to life? You know, to, if they want to cook, to be able to, to do that, if they, if they want to write or they yeah. want to create in various ways. Um, and again, it's not always about kind of like uh, having a meaningful job. It's about having meaningful uh, say in the work that you have, you know? Yeah. It's weird. It's almost harder to imagine things being a little better than it is, uh, mm. to imagine it being a lot better yeah. or a lot worse. Yeah. Huh. That's, um, That's fun. Why is that? Uh, imagining a little better, I guess maybe that's just, yeah. Because it's not as entertaining, yeah. it's not as satisfying to think about a little bit better. It's satisfying to think about, because that's another thing that I was, um, thinking about is this, this fantasy that, that, we have uh, uh that everyone will one that will all one day be rich you know like mm. the the uh we the poor keep getting poorer and the rich keep getting richer but the poor keep getting poorer while thinking they'll one day be rich yeah and the rich people don't have to worry about it and they are getting richer yeah so it's like this weird thing this thing that you're sold this idea like well you just keep it you know and you put your, it's like then you're just, you're gonna die one day still thinking that you're gonna be a millionaire yeah, yeah. Now, there's a whole libidinal investment that we have towards some objects, some things that will complete us, make us whole, this frenetic pursuit. And it's, it's, we need to find freedom from that frenetic pursuit. That kind of, and this is where minimalism is interesting because minimalism, one way of describing it philosophically might be to say that it is an attempt to disinvest from this libidinal frenetic pursuit of more and yeah. more and more but also it's not at its best a kind of uh, religion of nihilism that says get rid of your desire it's rather tries to orient your desire to nothing itself so you desire less so you still do desire but you don't desire stuff you mm. desire less. so a minimalist is often looking around going what can i get rid of <laughs> so they they're enjoying yeah they, they are getting enjoyment out of having less and they're an active participant in it they're yeah. not just going like well now i have nothing and sitting around you know yeah no they're like and they're like maybe thinking oh how could i build my own home and i'm going to learn on youtube how to plaster and how to put down floors and you know i'd like to make a smaller house that's yeah. my own so so there's this real desire that i think at its best you always have to engage libido otherwise you know so so you have to find a way to enjoy having less yeah um and one of the problems we have is because of mimetic desire we desire the desire of others we uh, the most precious material in the universe is others desire the desire of the one we desire and so because and advertisers know this so 
we're always surrounded by people we desire. Maybe it's a pop star or something. And we look at where their desire alights. So the pop star is drinking Diet Coke. And so I desire the pop, the desire of the pop star, the desire of the pop star alights on Diet Coke. Mm -hmm. I find myself desiring Diet Coke, even though I don't want it. So, so basically the infant, the child from the very beginning is trying to figure out what does the other desire? Yeah. The mother, usually the first other, right? And uh, Freud calls the, the, the abyss of the other's desire, that thing, the thing. So basically your, your first experience of your mother is what, what does she desire? What does she want of me? What is, what, and what, where she go? When she goes to work, she desires her partner. She has all these other desires. I want, I want her desire. And mm -hmm. you start to desire what she desires. All of that to say, we need to surround ourselves by people who desire less, yeah. <laughs> you know, so to kind of like to switch off from advertising to, to, to kind of connect with people who enjoy kind of a, a simpler life yeah. and then desire their desire. It's like a community. Yeah. It's so, like yeah. a community of, uh, yeah, people that you can uh, feed off of and use it to your advantage rather than just go, I gotta have that. Stuff. That's it. Cause the, because it, it's like creating the liturgy around you because you know, we may not believe that a car will make us, uh, will satisfy us, but we still act as if it does because the advertisers and all of that, like we're in a system in which we're kind of like, we're pulled by the nose with our uh -huh. desire. So yeah, to, yeah, it's, know. uh, yeah, I, 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 it's very easy for me to love the, uh, idea of having so few things, um, and sort of, uh, the problem is I don't know if I if I would maintain that if I uh, landed, you know, if I won a lotto ticket and had mm -hmm. $10 million. I feel like all of a sudden I would want a couple more things. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is a little bit of mm -hmm. that going on. Um, I also think that people generally make better decisions when they are not stressed out and freaked out constantly. And yeah. I wonder if that plays into the stresses that you're talking about with work, the the commute and the grind and then you have this other factor that we haven't mentioned yet which is covid uh that has given people the taste of staying at home and staying um recognizing that they can still get done that that certain aspects of their job were kind of a lie and that the world can keep going without um w you know without having to put pants on yeah absolutely and realizing that again another example of like working to live is People at the weekend sometimes go out, drink a lot, get lay, you know, let off steam. Yeah, and that's obviously bad for your health, and you know it's expensive. And then you realize, well, if I'm kind of like, you know, having a more chilled out day, yeah. and I, then I don't really feel the need to make my Saturday night something, and so suddenly I'm saving hundreds of dollars from the weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you start to realize, oh my goodness, that the work. That, that I'm doing to generate the money to pay for my lifestyle, that lifestyle is actually connected to me hating my job. I so hate my job that I want to go to Target and buy some stuff to distract me. I mm -hmm. want the holiday. I want to get drunk at the weekend. So, and so you can go, oh, there's a certain sense of which, and by the way, no one can do this quick. And you know, people have to live and whatever, but you start to go, okay, well maybe could I take a step back and work less hours, make less money, but also, purchase less things and can i think about actually learning how to you know get, get a smaller home yeah. that's actually and then do it up myself it's you know not that hard you know i'll learn the say off youtube videos that how to do stuff that instead of paying someone because i'm working so i can't you know i can't make the house up myself go that's going to cost tens yep. of thousands you go like you do it yourself so there's there's ways in which i mean i'm almost imagining at, at, this is a bit idealistic i don't think this is happening but I think to some extent what COVID did, one plus of people not working, is they're starting to imagine that other possibilities can happen. Like they're starting to go, I don't necessarily have to work all the time. I could go to a small town in America, lead mm -hmm. a, a simpler life. Um, that seems to be happening. And if that keeps going, that would be incredible. I also wonder too, if that's like an idea that people are thinking be as a result of, well, I mean, this, yeah, it goes without saying, I guess they're at home. Mm -hmm. And they're not in a car going, I gotta get this. and then it frees up time and it frees up their brain for a little idea to pop in. 
that wouldn't otherwise. It's like, yeah. oh, hey, wait, wait, we don't have to. Don't have to do that. Also, yeah, it's like uh, when you're talking about the going out and drinking and, and blowing off steam. The whole idea of blowing off steam implies that there's a steam buildup. Exactly, that's exactly it. Reduce your steam. Yeah, yeah. I mean, less even, steam. Yeah. I always say. Even the, all of the the kind of the growth industry, the billion dollar industry of meditation and juice cleanses and all of that, is a. Uh, is potentially the result of people being very dissatisfied yeah, in work. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you're you're very unhappy, dissatisfied. You have to. So you you know you go on your 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 retreat and you do all of that stuff, and that's all nice. But you kind of realize that 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 oh yeah, all of that this these cleanses and this kind of thing and the, my drug trip that I'm doing and all of that that is directly connected to not overly enjoying your everyday life. Escapism. Um, escapism, escapism, escapism. Because the funny thing is, like, to a certain extent, a book, this great thing about books is they're so cheap, mm -hmm. right? And you can go to a library and get them for free. And there is something really lovely about um, waking up, maybe reading fiction or reading nonfiction or kind of like, um, there's that doesn't cost anything. It's so cheap. It's my favorite thing. In the yeah. World. It's um, my favorite thing. Yeah. Oh, maybe yeah. not my favorite thing, yeah. but it's up there. Yes. Waking up in the morning before I've even had a chance to, like, get my bearings and just immediately starting to read is like for one it just jars the brain a little bit and yeah. it's kind of difficult for a second but yeah it's really nice yeah and then you've got time to start thinking about well what would i what would i want to do if i wasn't working all the time so somebody might go oh, i'd like to you know build a house or i'd like to be a mechanic and i'd like or i'd like to write a book or i'd like to be a chef or and you begin to kind of go okay if, if i if i not just constrained yeah you can dream a little bit bigger and it, you're not, it's not always possible to do. In fact, it's very hard to do, but it's, it opens up the possibility for something else. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I was, uh, cause I'm, I'm hap not happily, but I'm, I would say slightly dissatisfyingly unemployed, mostly unemployed, I would say right now. And I was talking about in therapy and I was going through kind of what my day consists of. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he was like, yeah, you're doing, you're doing exactly what you should be doing. Like there's no, you don't have to be freaking out the entire time and, uh, you can get satisfaction from that. And then, you know, you can hold that tension for a second. But I also think one thing we're ignoring in this conversation is the, um, there is a group of people mm. who will, for the sake of not wanting to do anything for hating the very idea of engaging with life in any way who will continue to, to feed off of the uh, right, the, the government, the, whatever you want to call all those negative stereotypes that I think become the image people have. This goes back to the interview with this, this person It is just the image is ingrained in people of that type of person who um, is uh, not taken seriously and doesn't want to be taken seriously and is happy not thinking about how they're going to improve themselves or how they're going to come up with a new creative project. And so it's, I just want to throw that out there because I yeah. feel like it's, I don't want to get stuck in this idea of like, well, you just, you know, everyone will suddenly become yeah. this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's always like, you know, there'll always be mental health and all of that. The big thing, but is in a healthy society where, you know, in a healthy society, People will want to be creative and will want to work, will want to produce. Will like that's a sign of health. Like a sign of ill health is depression, and depression being the lack of desire. Your desire doesn't function. So the ultimate depression is you don't want to get out of bed, right? You won't even get out of bed. You just literally food is fuel. You know, you you'll you'll take whatever handouts are there, but your desire isn't functioning. And that's a sign of um, that's a, that's a sign of, of your desire. It's almost done out of anger up. too. It seems like there's almost a little bit of a rebellious, like, I'm just not going to it's, yeah. which is, I guess what would it be masochistic almost to just be like, I'm going to just have nothing and I'm going to take what I can everyone instead, you know, that is kind of a, I guess that'd be depression. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's another thing, but it could, it could be anger. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a lot of suicide is anger. Often people who kill themselves often are doing it. It's an expression of anger at someone else, but turned into yeah. themselves. Like so, basically, you go like they'll they'll be jealous when I'm gone. So it is an anger direct, an anger that is kind of directed outward, but then is turned inward against the self. Yeah, as we said about too, yeah, the, the idea of depression being it's depressing the anger. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, so, yeah. you're actually shoving down the it, it comes out as depression, but really there's 
uh, boiling, you know, something boiling under the surface. Very yeah. fun. Yeah, about that, by the way. So I have a friend had this really interesting symptom um, where, uh, did I say this in the podcast before? But she uh, was sending a test. Uh, so it was a test that you had to breathe into a bag. And then this bag would be sent and be analyzed. So it was about kind of like enzymes within the body. Yeah, I know girls that do that on, never mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess they, it sells it on OnlyFans. The girl that <laughs> puts your fart in some jars. <laughs> yeah. Well, so she sends us off and uh, you're not allowed to, she goes to the post office and she has to sign a form saying there's no biological substances in the thing. And she's like, that's fine, you know. And then she sent it and then she felt really guilty because she was like, well, it is a biological substance, the bre- right. breathing in the bag. What if that blows up the plane? What if the, 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 this package of air blows up the plane and kills everybody and I'm arrested? And it was fascinating because at first you go, right, this is just this is a very interesting symptom because um, it was, a, you know, obviously an irrational fear. But it's like, oh, what was going on was there was a repressed anger that wasn't being able to be shared. And so her breath, her literally, her inner her words, her inner thoughts put into this bag that could blow up a plane, destroying someone else and arresting and destroying herself. And what was kind of behind it was a, a raging anger and frustration that was completely invisible to the person themselves, but was but was evidenced in the uh, symptom of wow. thinking that your breath was going to destroy a plane. And then well, that's that was a, a very imaginative uh, psychoanalytic reading, Pete. <laughs> that's very nice. Okay, yeah. So you're saying that the hot air, the, the breath itself sort of symbolized for them this, the, the, uh, the inner... Yeah, the, in, like ah. hot air. The hot air, you mean even the fact that you, the word hot air is very good, so it was an inner thing. And then the truth of the symptom is, does it work? You know, whenever you give the interpretation, does it open an access? Yeah, but yeah. yeah. But, and at first I didn't, when I first heard, saw it, I was like, it was baffling because symptoms are generally at first baffling. And then it was like, oh, oh yeah. Like, because a lot of people are, are terrified at their own anger and they bring it, repress it into themselves and it turns against them in the shape of guilt and, and self-condemnation. And really... I don't know anybody like that. No. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like me. Yeah, um, yeah I, have a, that's a, I have to start expressing anger more, apparently. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah Nietzsche, Nietzsche, yeah, Nietzsche said, like, well, very, and Freud said as well, but Nietzsche was like, yeah, if you can't express your anger, you can't, it has to go somewhere, so it turns inward, and it, you become, you know, the superego, basically, the, a part of your ego turns against itself, mm-hmm. and then, you know, you end up, yeah, so the some yeah. respects, you have to have a healthy expression of anger, but don't shout at me, are you angry at me, do you have to let no. anything, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm not angry at you, yeah. um, that's a problem too. If you have a, a truly repressed anger, you don't always know what, what it's. Uh, well, that's why this symptom, that was the thing. She had no idea. She had no idea of her. I completely, she was completely unaware of it. Yeah. And, that, and that's what, it, funnily enough, that's what a symptom is. A symptom, it has some connection to the thing and also looks completely different. Both. Yeah. So um, it was only in the interpretation of the symptom that it's like, oh, mm-hmm. that they go like, oh, the anger's there. Yeah, yeah, it's um. I'll get that where I'll I'll be angry and hasn't. I mean, this hasn't happened in years, but it'll be um. Not even that. I won't feel that angry, but then when I go to express it, the words would get caught and don't literally don't come out. Like yeah, they yeah. they get. I feel a th- in, uh my throat inflame a little bit or swell, and it's like they can't can't get it out. And uh, yeah, I've talked about that like ad nauseum. And it, there's some sort of connection with the anger versus floodgates versus just keeping it keeping it down like don't let that happen because if you let it out then that's bad and you'll lose your cool and you won't have your composure and if there's one thing everyone knows about me it's that i have to look cool at all times all yeah, the time. yeah absolutely <laughs> uh, all right well yeah. any uh i mean this oh, is yeah. such a big conversation so i don't want to cut it short but i'm also curious what others think about about it and i also i'm trying to go through my head just like i don't know i don't want it to seem like any of these points are uh falling into the idealistic yes i know trap. no no 100 percent. yeah it's a always a yeah I, yeah I just i don't know i there's an optimism too of where uh a slight shred of optimism in this this movement like it, anytime people 
seem to be com- becoming collectively aware of something at the same time. Um, it's always really exciting, and it does tend to the way of like, like I think about, um, I think it was like the second wave feminism uh, that didn't have any localized leader, uh, and then Wall uh, Occupy Wall Street, same idea, no centralized leader, and then now this anti work movement also no centralized leader and they tend to sort of dissipate um after a while and yeah. same with like you know the the even the game stops and the all the kind of you know going after it's like they these dis these movements that uh try to seem to fight against an established cultural like thing uh by way of being a little disorganized like in their nature tends to be disorganized it's almost like impossible to to yeah. fight against the monolith structures that we have had in place for you know so yeah. long yeah i mean at best some of these movements are are kind of like cries of no they're they're not like offering yeah. an alternative so much as they're saying there's they're pointing out some contradiction and antagonism within the existing system and then what happens is at their best yes they dissipate but at best they loosen up something yeah. That, and that's the thing. So at, at best, you're hoping that that this movement um, helps people start to th- some to to be to think about other ways in which they can work and yeah. spend their time. And um, I do, I honestly do think that as we progress, um, if we don't destroy ourselves, uh, we will move towards. Um, or we and we should be moving towards a more enriching form of work. We, I think I've, we have to. Yeah, get, it, it yeah. Will, um, it'll happen regardless. I, I just wonder. I hope it happens without there being an absolute catastrophe beforehand. Yeah, and that's exciting. What might have to happen sometimes? Because yeah, the last thing I want anyone to hear in this is is kind of the advice. Uh, any advice? Because obviously, for a lot of people, they're going like, "Well, listen, I have a I have a crap job." that I have to do because I, you know, I've got kids to support. I've got rent to pay. I can't just walk away from that. Well, absolutely not. Like oh God, so many of us. That. Yeah. That's such a form of, it's like, yeah, when I, yeah. 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 So like we're all caught to some extent. Like, well, what do you want me to do? System. You want me to just quit everything? Yeah. It's like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. We're all caught in the system, this system. So the, what all you can do is in, in whatever environment you're in is to try to, have a space for you to imagine alternatives yeah. and not even alternatives that you might be able to do but to to start thinking about okay is there are there options is there opportunities are there ways and you know that's- yeah if you zoom out if you can try to zoom out and not see uh your entire life as a piece by piece thing and see it as a in a more was it gestalt gestalt is that what oh, you gestalt, say gestalt yeah. gestalt um a more the whole picture um what you're saying reminds me of, because I've been on this Ian McGilchrist kick, mm. an Ian McGrill's kick for uh, quite a second. He wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary that I really love. But I was listening to a podcast of his. I think it was on a podcast called Rebel Wisdom. And it was, the interviewer was asking, basically The Master and His Emissary is a book about the two different brain hemispheres and how the left brain is very hyper-focused, sees things as um, the sum of their parts. It's very, uh, it's analytical, it's logical, it's linear. The right side of the hemisphere uh, takes information in holistically. New information goes through the right hemisphere. It sees things in metaphor. Um, it's what is activated when we listen to music and poetry and all this stuff. So he was asked the question of like, well, what is the actionable? What do we do? He's like, well, how do we get people away from this rigid linear way of thinking into this more sort of right brain, poetic, metaphorical, holistic way of thinking? And Ian McGilchrist was like, I do not ever plan on answering that question. And I don't want to answer that question for people because that's just another um, sort of left brain linear way of thinking about it. He's like, all I want to do is lead people into maybe their own different way of thinking about things that isn't, um, that isn't a system, uh, uh, you know? And so I think that's, it reminds, that's what, Hmm. reminds me of what you're saying of going like it's not going like oh i'm just gonna quit my job and then that then i'll be happy it's like nope nope that's not it just think about it use your imagination try to you know reflect a little bit yeah and and yeah that's brilliant and and listen to your symptoms like often often people 
uh, you know, if, if you're have certain kind of stomach issues or back issues or you have certain kind of fears or phobias, that's telling you that there's some part of your life that you're pro that that's not working. And so you kind of like, yeah, kind of start to listen mm -hmm. to the symptoms, listen, think about what is it in your, in your life that is causing you alienation, that is causing you suffering. And yeah, be as what you say, can't be imaginative. You digest, what can't you, yeah. Yes, exactly. And then try to be imaginative about possible ways to change that. And sometimes just just being aware that you can't change it is good. Sometimes you're like, listen, I, I hate this, but I can't change it for now. Even that insight is um is better than the alternative, which is pretending to yourself that you like your situation. Yeah. Like that's it, that's it. Like so people who pretend that they um like the relationship they're in. That's even worse than the person who says, I can't get out of this right now, but it's not good. Like that's a step forward. <laughs> yeah. Or the manic, uh, alternative of going, I have to blow everything up to, I have to blow everything into sky high. Yeah. Uh, get out of this now and get out of this now. And cause that's also just like a, yeah, a yeah. bad idea. I think there's a, the famous, one of the famous lines in, in, uh, Marx and the, the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. He says, religion is the imaginary flowers on the chains of our oppression. We what must, uh, oh, yes. religion, yeah. religion is the imaginary flowers and the chains of our oppression. We must get rid of the flowers, not so that we see the chains in despair, but so that we can break the chains and pick living flowers. And the, his idea there is simply that, and whether it's religion or whether it's yoga or whether it's, you know, I, Netflix doesn't matter, whatever it is that, that kind of is a kind of painkiller that prevents you seeing the, the chains that you're in, mm -hmm. you got to get rid of the painkiller and then you'll see the chains. So that's negative. So now you see the chains, that shit, but that gives you more of a possibility of breaking the chains and picking living flowers. Um, so yeah, we're, we're full of, we're full of painkillers. Mm -hmm. The world is full of painkillers at the moment. Um, you know, obviously t lots of entertainment is a type of painkiller. Uh, Futurism. That's another one. No, oh, futurism as in the, you know, um, well, we're just going to have it's, I think the obsession over, oh. um, things like the metaverse and things oh, like yeah. moving into a futuristic utopia, obsessing over folks, um, like Musk in a way that, that takes them out of their own life and their own kind of situation. Yes. Yeah. All fantasy. that, that, yeah, that kind of, yeah, that, that future is not fantasy that, that prevents us from kind of looking at the difficult things in our lives. So there's a certain, and by the way, we all need a little bit of painkiller. So it's not about getting rid of all of the imaginary flowers at once, yeah. but it's, uh, we got to start seeing I like flowers suffering. of all kinds. Yeah. Um, what's the word? Asceticism? Asceticism? Asceticism. Asceticism. Yeah. Asceticism. Asceticism. You tell I read these words, but I never say them. <laughs> yeah. uh, what does that mean? Isn't that like the, the sort of, um, withdrawal the withdrawal aesthetes, from yeah. all kind of pleasure and all kind of comfort like yeah the, yeah the ace deep is yeah someone who withdraws completely yeah, yeah. not um, that not that yes i wouldn't i'm uh yeah i i, I think the, so religions of of hedonism basically say you can fulfill your desire and religions of nihilism say get rid of your desire um i don't like either of those you know you like, don't desire any of those. Yes, I don't desire any of those. You gotta have a religion of the absurd. You're you're you know. the Goldilocks of desire. Yes. Yeah. Like, well, what is it, Goldilocks of three words? Yeah. Well, although I'd be the yeah, the opposite, because that's the just right. I wanna say it's kind of like the um you've got to enjoy your lack of enjoyment. Maybe it is the Goldilocks, a version of Goldilocks. <laughs> I know you mean that. Yeah, you don't want to, it's the contradiction. It's too much balance. balance. Yes, yeah. it's just, you know, I'm against, I know I'm where against you're going. balance. I'm against symmetry. I'm against harmony. <laughs> well, let's end before we just hear that, you yeah. know? <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. That's uh, This is how I'm going to sit for all the podcasts, by the way. That's, not good. That's a good look for you. Man. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Um, folks, thank you so much for listening to this. Uh, very curious your ideas. Please leave a comment down below in the YouTube box, or you can tweet at us or message us if you have thoughts on the matter. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is, a, this is uh, I'm imagining this is a bigger sort of subject than it actually is. Maybe right now a lot of people are just like, I don't want to think about that. I'm yeah. busy and I get that too. I, know, I, said, man, I think we should revisit the subject. I think we're really touching the surface. We really almost. are. Yeah, yeah, because it is really interesting about how to, how to, be, how to find enjoyment in, in your work and in your life and how to kind of like uh, start pulling back from those parts of our lives that are, that, you know, take 40 hours of our week. Yeah. Um, for very little recompense, even when you're paid well. That's the thing. Even when you're paid well, it doesn't matter. Like, mm. 
No, it really doesn't. I, uh, I'm really excited about, I just signed up for a pottery class. Oh, did you? Yeah, finally. I've been uh, wanting to do it for a year. And, that's uh, a bit coming a big thing. My friend Phil Harrison does that, and there's a pottery yeah. place just down down yeah. the route from me, and I see them all in there. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Nice, I'm yeah. excited about it. Um, and uh, I think about that in terms of, like, I don't really, like, I'm doing it for, I think it's cool, and it seems like it's got to be incredibly relaxing and, and neat, and um, you have something at the end of it to show for it. I think that's really cool, but a big part of it is just going, I want a hobby mm. and this is the hobby I'm going to do and, uh, and treat it like, you know, uh, sacrifice in the sense of learning a new hobby. And then, uh, that's completely different than what I normally do. I'm very, yeah. very excited about it. So that we can have a whole, uh, podcast sometime on hobbies that uh, are outside. Cause the other, only other hobby I have is reading and watching YouTube lectures on yeah, people yeah. I'm reading. It's like yeah. I read and then I get tired and then I turn on the TV and then it's, easier to take in so anyway yeah cool any right. uh any closing thoughts Anything good no that was fun i mean maybe closing thought is yeah the anti-work movement that i that you introduced me to today um is uh i'm, I'm concerned about this notion of anti-work i gotta go like i say i can think work is good work is sacrifice and doing something is where where we get pleasure um but it's all about anti-alienation so uh that's my takeaway is that i and i think probably that lies at the core of some of this anti-work thing is it's actually anti uh we're alienated from yeah. from our employment and uh, that's not a good thing it makes you i think alienated from yourself a little bit yeah, yeah. you yeah. feel like you're um it's got to be just a, a deep it's like a issue of feeling devalued um and also the jarring effect i think that maybe i'm wrong but i imagine people experience when they they go into work and it's like they themselves go into almost a zombie mode and then they come out the other side and they go home and they eat dinner and then yep. they get a few hours of being themselves yeah and then they go back in and it's like the zombie and the being themselves are a you know part of life sometimes but the constant the daily going back and forth twice a day of going back like okay i'm myself Oh, okay. No. Uh, okay. Like it's yeah. gotta be, it's like starting a car over and over again. and like wearing down the ignition a little bit is what yeah. I, um, the, yeah. what I think about. And by the way, the, the anti-idealistic part of this is to, so in America, there's various ways you can do this, but in America, one of the things was crappy jobs were what young people did. Yeah. Right? And that makes sense. And you go, you do your crappy job, uh, to get a bit extra pocket money. It also teaches you lots of skills lots of life skills um and then you know you go off and maybe try and do something else so it's not that so somebody might go like well who does all the crappy jobs you go, well the kids <laughs> and that's part yeah. of that's part of your initiation but the problem now is that adults for all of their lives are doing crappy jobs yeah like so working in it like working in a fast food place is not a problem when you're young and when you're you're looking to do other things you're looking for a bit extra pocket money for drinks at the weekend that's all great it's different when you're you know 40 years old and you're trying to support a family it's just and not you're doing that it's like different world yeah different world. it's like um it's it used to be that you would the blue collar whatever you know path is like you go and you you apply at the factory you spend two weeks training and you know to adjust the whatever you adjust yeah. the things but now it's you go in and you apply and you need to have an understanding of how the microchip works that that does that for you mm. and you have to be able to calibrate it and you have to be able to and it's like even the jobs that we think of as being like in the old you know days mm -hmm. of like manual it's like a lot of these are more and more are becoming something that is either automated or that you need more and more information about in order to be able to do and get the job which requires money requires more you know trade schooling and all that stuff and it's kind of a yeah it's it's yeah. it's not it's not as cut and dry i think of a situation as people think when they go well you should go get a job you work you, you know yeah so okay very sense? good but do you have a takeaway was that your takeaway that was my takeaway oh, okay bolts something right. about bolts all right bye everybody thank Take you care. so much bye. oh no if anybody's still listening yeah. I'm doing my first ever live stream comedy show on oh, February yes. 18th. You can get tickets at rushticks.com, link in the bio, uh, or in the description of this podcast. And it's, uh, yeah, it's like 10 bucks ticket. Come hang out. It's going to be half an hour of stand up. There's going to be a feature, a host, and a Q&A afterward. And I would love to see you there. And I'm going to write a bunch of fun stuff. And I think it'll be really neat. Very good. All right. Bye-bye.